Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Hey, it's Jordan. I hope you enjoyed Fixing Canada. This past week, we certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. When we sat down to think of which issues we'd try to solve when putting that week together, obviously there was one on the list that you didn't hear. Housing. And that's because somebody else has already done that. And we had them on the show. No, seriously. Uh, Gregor Craigie, who is a journalist out in British Columbia, wrote an amazing book that you're about to hear him discuss that looked at ways other cities around the world have solved or at least drastically improved their housing situations. There was really nothing we thought we could add to it, but in the spirit of this week, since some of you probably expected us to tackle housing, uh, we thought we'd re-up this one. So have a listen. He's a smart man. We'll talk Monday. It can be easy to look at Canada's problems and then at our status as one of the world's most liberal and desirable countries and conclude that we're doing as well as anyone. And the biggest problems we have are problems everywhere. It doesn't work that way, especially when it comes to housing. While politicians here of every stripe, make incremental changes to policy or promise to boost supply or make homes somehow slightly more affordable, there are world-class cities all over the globe that have found actual solutions to housing crises. Some of those solutions, for sure, involved luck and circumstance, but others involved dedicated and determined action. Many of them involved thinking truly differently about what homes are, what we need from them, and what makes them actually work for a population. This is not a matter of a city's size or attractiveness or livableness or any other of those qualities. These solutions can be found in Paris and Tokyo, in Berlin, in Helsinki, major cities that find ways to make sure homes are achievable for almost anyone who wants or needs to live and work there. So while our politicians seem to view the housing crisis as something to be managed and mitigated, we gotta ask, if they can do it, why can't we? It's a simple question. It's just the answer that's complicated. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Gregor Craigie is the host of CBC's On the Island. He is the author of several books, including his latest, Our Crumbling Foundation, How We Solve Canada's Housing Crisis. No uh, no pressure there, Gregor. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Talk about setting yourself up for failure, eh, hey, hey, Jordan? But, uh, but it, it seemed like a good title. You're going to do that on the show today, right, for us? Exactly. Yeah. Just give me 30 minutes. That's about how long it should take to solve this. Yeah. Maybe just begin. And, and throughout this interview, I should say, we'll talk less about how we got here and the direness of our situation now, mostly because we've covered it many, many times on the show. And I'm interested in the context and potential solutions. But uh, maybe first, because it's fascinating and I didn't realize this, tell us about Canada's first tent cities at the end of the line. I was fascinated to, to learn more about this in the research for this book because I was vaguely aware, having spent, you know, more than a quarter of a century in, in B.C. as an adult and, and uh, talking to a lot of old-time British Columbians, that there used to be, uh, in the 1930s, a lot of homeless encampments, what we might call them today, which at the time were, were widely called hobo jungles or hobo encampments. And again, that's the terminology of the time. Uh, but per perhaps nowhere bigger than than what they called the hobo jungle in 1931 in Vancouver, because, of course, the Great Depression was going on and with incredibly high unemployment and so on. A lot of people were hopping the railway and making their way west, uh, desperate for work or food or a place to stay. And of course, a lot of them got to the end of the line. Terminal City, as Vancouver is also known, and uh, wound up with no jobs, no food, very few prospects. And a lot of them started what, what I don't want to say it's Canada's first homeless encampment, but it's the first one uh, that a lot of us will be aware of. And the first big one 
uh, on the edge of the city dump close to uh, Strathcona Park in Vancouver, where there was another giant homeless encampment uh, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. When you set out to write a book about Canada's housing crisis, a subject, as I mentioned, a lot of outlets have covered extensively. What did you think was missing from uh, the analysis and the conversation around it? I think what I thought was missing was something to put it all together and and make sense of it for me, because your point's well taken, Jordan. I mean, you've covered this extensively, the high human cost of this, how, how it destroys people's lives in many cases and, and can cause social upheaval. And so had I as a daily journalist. But I had a bit of an epiphany three years ago in early January 2021 when I was at home, not at work as a journalist, but I, I ripped open my uh, 2021 BC property assessment, and the number just seemed to scream off the page at me, $1.3 million. And I'm in this 110-year-old ramshackle house in Victoria. I'm a journalist, very middle class. And you're a millionaire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, on paper. And that, you know, I even heard the bare naked ladies if I had a million dollars just for like, right. like 10 seconds. But then I realized, you know, my wife's a teacher. I'm a journalist. There's no way we could afford this house now. Uh, but we were lucky enough uh, by timing to buy our first house in 2004. And I basically thought, you know, my kids are screwed. So uh, I mean, and, and of course, I'd had this this anxiety for years that that was happening. But then at the start of the pandemic, property prices soared. And I thought, you know, this is this is just untenable for the city where I live, Victoria and Vancouver, where I have many friends in Toronto, and it's getting worse. And so I went looking for a book, I thought, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but I want something to kind of synthesize uh, the human suffering and the possible solutions and not really being able to find one that focused on Canada exclusively. I thought, well, hey, there's my next book uh, book idea. One of the things that I was shocked at, and I will say uh, in the book, you alternate examples of Canada's problems that we face, often illustrated with heartbreaking anecdotes from the people caught up in them, uh, with examples of very similar places that either don't have those problems or ha have solved them. Were you expecting when you went out to research this to find so many of the world's like marquee cities, places where you would expect property values to be through the roof and housing to be scarce, to be doing so much better than we are? The short answer is yes. And with the giant caveat, because I'm sure some people will hear this and they'll say, well, hang on, what about uh, London or what about New York or what have you? Right. I, I just want to uh, clarify, many other countries are really struggling with housing affordability. So there's the first caveat. But I just presumed that everywhere was. And so one of the first city that surprised me was the world's biggest one and the biggest metropolis area. Anyway, Tokyo. Uh, I interviewed Canadian after Canadian after Canadian after Canadian living in Japan for years. And they all said, I want to come back to Canada, but I can't afford to. And, you know, it's just I don't know about you, Jordan, but I just thought, what, Tokyo? How is Tokyo uh, way more affordable? And I don't mean like it's, oh, it's 10 percent rents or 10 percent less than they are in Toronto and Vancouver. I mean, it's astoundingly cheap by modern Canadian comparisons, at least for rent, well, and property purchases. So Tokyo really surprised me. And, and Japan is a complicated uh, comparison because it's, you know, I, I, some of the people I said cautioned me, they said, OK, fine, compare, but take it with a huge grain of salt. It's not just apples to apples it's, or apples to oranges. It's like apples to concrete, one person told me. They said it's very difficult to compare. And yet you do see what happens when a few things happen, I think, in Tokyo. Uh, the, the first thing is in Japan, a population is declining. So, I mean, there, there's a whole other issue that we're not at in Canada. In fact, we're, we have one of the highest population growth rates anywhere. Uh, so that obviously says something about supply and demand and availability of housing in a country with 8 million empty homes. But it also says a lot, uh, according to a lot of experts I spoke to who know both countries really well, about their transportation system, their excellent transportation system in and around Tokyo, as well as some of the zoning regulations and reforms they made about 20 odd years ago after the financial crash and, and the, the start of the deflationary era in Japan, where they, where they said, you know what, we can't have so much, for lack of a better term, NIMBY stops on, on local development. We need to have more nimble reconstruction, rebuilding and repurposing of buildings in and around Tokyo. And arguably it had a pretty big effect. Because you touched on it, uh, how quickly our population is increasing, you know, how much of this is systemic failures? We haven't prepared for this. We haven't built enough housing. Uh, we have tons of zoning issues. Uh, and how much of it is a result of being, frankly, one of the most attractive destinations in the world for people from all over? And, 
you know, this is kind of the downside of that that comes with being such a leading country in terms of quality of life and everything else. I think a huge amount of it is exactly that, uh, Jordan. And, and But I appreciated your pointing out the planning aspect of that, because, of course, immigration and population numbers aren't just an accident. They're a result of specific policies. And I also want to just, again, clarify my answer to say that when we talk about immigration in, in connection with housing, which I think we have to, it, it is not a critique of immigration. It's, it's no immigrant's fault that prices are going up. But arguably, the federal government, and this is a, there's a growing chorus of this around the country among people I've spoken to, arguably, the federal government has not prepared adequately our housing supply and all of the conditions around housing supply with their increasing of immigration numbers. We've the last two years, we've hit immigration records in this country, but we haven't been keeping pace with housing. And that's something that we've heard. I mean, I'm here in BC in Victoria in the capital, and I've spoken with our housing minister and our premier directly about this. And they're both pretty frustrated. The, the housing minister, Ravi Kalan, uh, directly asked his federal uh, counterpart for a new formula that would tie funding of affordable housing construction to immigration numbers. And he says, look, we're not against immigration. We understand it's a success story. But if it's going to continue to be a success story, the federal government needs to do a lot better job tying housing supply with a growing population numbers because of immigration. And what you end up with, uh, if you don't do that, is a lot of resentment that's then misdirected towards immigrants because we're not ready for it. And your frustration point is really interesting. I spoke back in December with Olivia Chow, the mayor of Toronto, obviously an incredibly progressive politician. And she was frustrated that she was able to cut a deal with Doug Ford, the conservative premier, before uh, she could get anything done through the federal government. When you look around at other cities that have done this, how do the governments work together to make it happen? And where's maybe a good example of a similarly attractive destination that has prepared and thrived with high immigration levels? Let me give you an example of Paris now, and with with the caveat that I have to say their immigration uh, levels have been considerable, though not as high as Canada. And I don't want to dwell on immigration, but the last couple of years, Canada has had the highest population growth and immigra- uh, by immigration of all the G7 countries, of all the OECD countries, of, you know, like the vast majority of countries on earth, other than a few dozen developed countries. So we are really growing because of immigration at a strong clip. Nonetheless, there are examples, and I think Paris is an excellent one. Over the last decade or so, they've had a, what you could probably call a heavy-handed approach by the national governments, but they've had buy-in from regional and city governments in Ile-de-France, uh, uh, Paris, and around it, the metropolitan area. And it's been studied by outside researchers at MIT and elsewhere who've looked at it, and they've said, what's happening in, in uh, greater Paris bucks the trend, and it's because of government policy that essentially put quotas on each and every municipality in Greater Paris that said, you have to, it doesn't matter how wealthy a municipality you are or not, you have to meet minimum quotas, uh, like in the range of of Paris, for instance, of 25% affordable housing. Well, lo and behold, Paris has actually eclipsed that and they've raised their uh, their benchmark to 30 and they're looking at 35% over the next decade or so. How does that compare to us, just for the record? Oh, you know, I, to, to be honest, I don't even know the percentages because they're so much smaller. They're so much smaller. Well, first of all, so Canada's federal government has largely divested from that kind of public housing since uh, the days when Paul Martin was finance minister of 1993, 1994, because they were trying to balance the budget. And one of the biggest ways that they saved money was pulling out of public housing construction. I mean, we, we have about 40% more population, or let me rephrase that. At the time, 30 years ago, we had about 60% of our population. But now our, our overall uh, supply of public housing in this country is only slightly larger than it was when we had not much more than half the population. So we have not kept pace anywhere near it. And it's interesting. It's telling when you go to places like the city of Vancouver or Toronto or Victoria or Calgary and look sometimes when a developer will tout the number of affordable houses that are in the overall mix. Some of them are getting up there, but often we're talking about dozens among hundreds of units or even fewer. So the idea of 25 percent uh, is huge. And, it's, and they've had a carrot and stick approach in France where they offer incentives to municipalities, cities and towns that make their quotas and, and strong penalties 
uh, where they don't. They've also coupled it with a huge investment or, or, or freeing up of public land through the SNCF and the other uh, public railways, the military, all sorts of public agencies have found public land that's allowing them to build a massive new transportation, public transit infrastructure with new hubs where there'll be commercial space, lots more housing. And, and the conclusion of uh, Yona Freemark, an MIT uh, academic who studied this, he said, Paris proves, and he compared it to London and New York, among other similar sized municipalities, which were put to shame by the number of new infill housing in Paris. He said, Paris proves that, uh, that uh, giant met metropolitan areas that are growing, it, they do not need to be stuck. And uh, crucially, they don't need to build and sprawl into their outlying green farmland, their green belts, which of course is something that is a huge issue in and around Toronto. So I, thought, I think pa Paris offers some really interesting lessons for this country. We've talked about the amount of people who need housing. I want to talk about the type of housing that they need or maybe that they expect. You have a chapter on Brampton in your book about people spreading to the suburbs and buying those, I mean, I'm going to call them stereotypical single family homes, right? You got a nice driveway, a two car garage, you got a backyard uh, and you can raise children in them. I'm not trying to blame Canadians for the housing crisis in which many governments have failed them. But is there, um, is there a difference between expectations and reality in this country when it comes to the kinds of housing we imagine when people say we need to build more homes? You've got several examples in your book of cities who have embraced different types of housing in order to solve an urgent need. Can you kind of explain how expectations for homes can differ? Absolutely. I mean, I don't know about you, Jordan, but I grew up in a big single family house. And, you know, when I left uh, home and, and uh, got my job and went to university, I, I think I always had it as just an absolute presumption that that's what I would graduate to. I would move into. It's like a mark of being a grown up in this country. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and, and I'm aware of a bit of the irony here. I want to be careful. I just want to confess that I'm sitting in my single family home in Victoria. I'm 50. And that's a privilege that I, I think I was just on the cusp of. We, we got into a single family home. Having said that, I also rented out to students to help with the mortgage. And but but yeah, I, I grew up with that presumption. It wasn't until until I was 20 five or six, I moved to England and I worked as a journalist in London for several years. And at first I thought, how do these people live in these tiny squished houses? This is not, I mean, I'm living the student life. I am not going to live like this. But after a year and then two and three, I thought, wait a minute, why are we living the way we are in Canada? I don't mean that, that we should ban single family houses, that people should feel shame for living in a, you know, there's nothing wrong with single family houses, but single family houses dominate uh, most Canadian urban and certainly suburban landscapes. And, and they literally uh, have dominated to the exclusion, like the, the practical banning in so many neighborhoods like mine, where I'm talking to you from right now, for the better part of a century. And, and we really have to ask ourselves, as many cities around the world are asking, should we start to reexamine that? That doesn't mean banning single family homes. As some people say, they, they almost get their hair on fire and they say, they're going to ban single family homes. They're just, they're destroying the, 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 the character of the neighborhood. Well, wait a minute. Is that what's happening? Or are they saying it should be just as easy to walk into City Hall and pay your money and have consulted a builder and get a building permit for a fourplex of the same size or roughly the same size as a McMansion? Uh, but it's not in most Canadian cities and towns as it stands right now. That is not a silver bullet for the housing crisis, but it's a significant start to adding more supply. When I think about places in Canada that do have similar approaches. And and maybe you can tell me uh, this is wrong. And I know that uh, short-term rentals have a way of messing this all up. But I think of Montreal with all of those walk-ups where you have three or four units in a single, I guess, quote-unquote house, because that's what it is. And they are just spread out all over the city. And for many, many years until quite recently, I think most of Canada looked to Montreal as a place where housing was still affordable, even as it climbed out of reach uh, in places like Toronto and Vancouver. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, with that uh, caveat that you mentioned, the, uh, the short-term rental effect, the Airbnb effect. I mean, I, I stayed briefly in Montreal for four or five months about 20 years ago, coming from Vancouver. And at the time, I could not believe how affordable it was. And not, you know, and for a great rental, 
in a great neighborhood. I mean, Montreal is a great city, the character, and, and it is much more dense. And yet you have spaces for families to live uh, great lives and great houses. But to your point of the short-term rental accommodation, I confess I went back with my family, I guess, right before the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's say the spring of 2019. And I didn't even think about it. I just, my confession, I didn't think about it. I've got three kids, family of five. It's hard to find a hotel room. So we said, hey, Le Plateau, look at this great uh, place. A walk up in Le Plateau, a fantastic neighborhood. And as we're there for about five days, I'm looking around and, and we realize this was somebody's home until very recently. And this actually could be, arguably should be someone's home again, not you know, not a, a profit uh, making vehicle. That, that's a whole, the, the short term rental thing is, is a whole issue in and of itself. And I, I know you've discussed it, but, but that really hit me at the time. I'm part of the problem here, having this great vacation in Montreal. Uh, this is a problem, but to the, the, the setup of Montreal, there's a reason it was considered a renter's paradise for so many decades. Yeah. Let's talk about how we can fix this, not overnight, but over uh, decades. And maybe we should start with short-term fixes, because there are some examples of that in your book as well. And maybe give us some hope as we look at a really tough winter uh, with encampments in most cities and towns in, in the country now. What are some cities that have managed to tackle an urgent homelessness crisis on the way to fixing a larger housing problem? And how did they do it? I look at a lot of specific measures and I make the point at the risk of belaboring it that none of them will work on its own. There is no silver bullet. And I, and I profiled literally dozens of, of ideas that I, I think are probably necessary in this country. But some of them arguably provide, and, and I should say most of those take years, but some of them undeniably are much quicker than others. Let me give you an example from uh, Ireland, uh, Dublin and Cork and a few other cities where uh, Ireland was extremely generous uh, after Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine in, in 2022. I mean, it's a small country of, you know, three and a half or four million people, but they took above their share uh, compared to most other countries of displaced Ukrainians. And at a time when, you know, Ireland's had its own housing troubles. So I'm not presenting Ireland as the panacea, the country that has solved housing once and for all, because it's not. But they generously uh, agreed to take in many displaced Ukrainians. And one of the, 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 the solutions they turned to in a number of towns and cities, it, it was modular housing. So modular housing, put simply, is off-site construction of either whole uh, small apartments or rooms or components of a house uh, or, or portions thereof that are, are built in an off-site uh, off factory and then trucked to the location and installed relatively quickly. And then you get your plumbers and engine, or sorry, electricians in, and they finish the roof and so on. Well, they were doing this in Ireland and, and it was cutting down what they had estimated. And, and, and they can point in Ireland to a number of specific examples where they say, these houses here, uh, the Monaghan neighborhood, just outside of Cork, a nice new neighborhood, these would have taken two to three years. We're talking about a manner of months. Once we find the land, and that was the difficulty, but because they were building modular uh, housing that could be installed much quicker, they could have or less the building, uh, the, the total completion times in some cases. The other thing about modular housing, which we do use in limited uh, numbers here in some parts of the country, is that it also can help with the, the shortage of construction labor in that indoor work at a factory that you're going to go to every day. Uh, a lot of the modular construction associations in Ireland and the UK have said it's helped them immeasurably with uh, labor shortages because A, they, they can get a, more, a greater diversity of, of workforce, a lot more women they could hire, people who, who can't because of family commitments or what have you afford to be on the road at a construction site the next town over an hour away where they don't know where they'd stay. But if it's all at the same location, they have much better luck with labor. And so it can, it, the, the costs, they say, are marginally lower. I haven't confirmed that. I don't know that to be the case, though that's the claim. The, the real argument in favor of modular is that uh, it tends to be a lot quicker and can have some advantages uh, with labor. But there's a number of small uh, solutions like that. There's also promising ones for the future, like 3D printing of all things, where houses are much quicker to put up, especially smaller houses with 3D printing. These giant 3D printers that can, that can put up, they can print a 500 square foot, so small, but a 500 square foot, say a one bedroom home or apartment layer on layer in less than 24 hours. It's astonishing to, to see these things. They're these, they look like giant uh, IT towers and then a giant rail that I think extends about uh, as up to 40 feet across 
and the print head goes back and forth and you have a crew of two people with iPads watching it. And the print head is, it looks like an ice cream, a soft serve ice cream cone dispenser pouring out a special blend of cement. And it just follows this track according to the, the 3D printer plan. And over 24 hours, you can get all of the walls uh, reinforced in an earthquake zone in, in a Mexican city where they've done this sturdy walls uh, in incredibly short order. And there are some American companies and others that are working on mass producing this. It's being used in Kenya and other places. Those are two examples of quicker fixes. Uh, and, and, but it leads me to my bit of pessimism here, if you'll allow me, Jordan, which is to say that a lot of these fixes, which are absolutely doable and achievable, and some have already been started, they are going to take years. I mean, there, there aren't a lot of quick fixes, unfortunately. Maybe the next place to go uh, to sort of round this all out, because there are a ton of great ideas in, in the book that people can read and, and see the examples for themselves, is when we look at other world-class cities like Tokyo, which you mentioned, Paris, uh, also Berlin, uh, which has found interesting solutions. I'm not going to ask you to walk me through what all the solutions are, but what's the missing ingredient that those cities have that enables them to tackle this stuff at relative speed, at least, and at scale? To be honest, I'm going I'm to give you two answers. The first one is quick, and I'll, I'll gloss over it, but I honestly think part, a good part of it is luck. If I look at, like, I looked at Berlin, and, and Germany is fortunate, it's not just luck, but they're fortunate to have made the decision a long time ago, decades ago, to have a much higher proportion of co-op housing uh, buildings and units. And that really does help when you come into an affordability crisis. So they have per person about 10 times the rate of, of, of people living in co-op housing as Canada does. And I, I mean, I can't say that was a specific policy decision in the last few years to address affordability because it wasn't. So that's a bit of luck. I arguably, you could say uh, Japan's population woes, which of course have problems when you have a shrinking population, they've been a bit of good luck when it comes to affordability. But I'm going to come back to Paris and not go into the mechanics, but to say uh, the missing ingredient for a lot of years until they finally got it. And what maybe we're seeing in this country is a decision to do something about it. Yeah. The whole country needs to have an epiphany. I used that word before. The federal government might just have got there with some help from the opposition or polls, or I don't know, I'll leave that to other people to decide. Provincial governments are starting to get there. Our municipalities are starting to get there. And as we talked about earlier, Jordan, just in our attitudes as Canadians, you know, maybe I don't need to have a single family home. Uh, we all need to have that epiphany to say, this is a crisis. We need to address this, not just out of a question of fairness for people, especially young people, but others who, who can't afford a home or can't be secure in a home, but for the stability of society, for goodness sakes, and, and for the future of this country. We don't want people to feel so disengaged from society or like they, they, they have been cheated of just a, a, a safe place to live. So I think what, what Paris has done and what other countries around the world and what Canada needs to do is make the decision. We need to act. We need to take really decisive, bold steps at all levels uh, to, to, to start turning the tide on this. And I hope that's just begun to happen over the last year or so. During the last year, while well, you've been working on this book, it seems at least like uh, the federal government and others want to take it more seriously. And these days, every week or two, a provincial government or the federal government is announcing X number of new homes in this community or that community compared to what is needed. How is that pace? I know it will be years before we see them, but I guess I'm wondering when people can know that the stuff that's being announced is at least enough to pay off in the end if we wait for it, rather than just a drop in, in what's going to be a huge bucket 10 years down the line. Well, I've been talking to so many people about this and, and from different, if I can call them ideological perspectives, housing activists, social workers, uh, builders, uh, building associations. And it's been really heartening to hear a fair bit, not complete, but a fair bit of agreement on the idea that we really need to start having a lot more housing. Supply is, with caveats, an issue. And so uh, to get to back to your question specifically, I think it is going to get better. And these recent announcements are going to increase supply. They really are if they're followed through on. And that's where, as a journalist and a cynic, I'm a bit hesitant. I mean, if you go back and look at the federal liberals' 2015 campaign promises on affordable housing, 
I mean, come on, they have not followed through. And that's not my opinion. That's the parliamentary budget office, uh, officers, uh, thorough analysis and, and many others. And just a simple look at their campaign pledges and the numbers in their own press releases. You can look at those 2015 campaign promises on a lot of things. <laughs> Yeah, this is could true. be judged that way. I know. And of course, you could say that, and I'm sure it was ever thus with every party and every government. And, and this is my, I don't, I mean, no partisan attack against anybody because many other parties, provincial governments and so on, uh, not to mention uh, uh, governments federally have done largely the same thing. But that's, so that's the, the point. If they follow through on the many promises we've seen at the federal level, uh, provincial levels, municipalities uh, pledging and moving towards missing middle housing, getting rid of just single family zoning. If all that happens, what we've seen so far, my best guess is given our population growth, our, our significant population growth, maybe it might get us in years to come halfway there. And so that's, I know that's kind of pessimistic, but I actually think we will get better as a country. This, this issue will start to turn around, but I think it's going to uh, get worse before it gets better. And I'm sorry to end on a, uh, on a negative note, but you know, we just keep seeing more and more homeless encampments popping up. I think we're going to continue to see that because there's a lag time and the governments are only, in my opinion, just finally getting serious about this. All the activists, all the builders, everybody I've talked to in the last two, three months about the federal and provincial announcements have said, yes, 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 we like this, we support this, but they say this is just the beginning. So, so I mean, to summarize uh, a lot of people from various viewpoints, point of view on this, uh, Jordan, keep going is, is the two word answer I keep hearing from a lot of people to government. Keep going. You, you're, you're only just beginning. And, and if we really want to solve this, you've got to keep going. Gregor, thank you so much for this. Uh, thanks for the book and anybody who wants a more comprehensive understanding of how we got here and, and what else is possible should uh, go take a look and uh, best of luck to you. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Gregor Craigie, the author of Our Crumbling Foundation, How We Solve Canada's Housing Crisis. That was the big story. I am so happy to be back. I hope you had a great time with Melissa last week. She was amazing. And for more from us, or if you want to hear any of Melissa's episodes from last week, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can offer us feedback for me, for Melissa, for anyone else by sending an email to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by picking up the phone and calling us and leaving a voicemail at 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in every podcast player you might like to play it in. It's also available just to play on the web at our website. It's also available on your smart speaker. Just ask it to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.